end during the year with a lecture in Washington DC named after Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer, which we very sadly had to postpone. It was the very first thing Brookings had to postpone in early April because of the pandemic. We would have had the distinguished Pakistani uh, human rights advocate, uh, Hina Jilani speaking to us. And we've all decided to postpone this to uh, a time when we can all meet again in person. Um, the first thing I want to do before I um, introduce you to our panel is to uh, let you see a brief welcoming message from the representative of our funders, Deputy Mayor of The Hague, Saskia Breunis, and I hope I pron pronounced that correctly. And you can show the video now. That would be, that would be our partners in The Hague who have to show it. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on what time zone you are in. Welcome in The Hague. As a deputy mayor for international affairs, I have a keen interest in today's topic. How can we strengthen the foundations of the Atlantic Bridge between the US and Europe? President-elect Biden promises the US will recommit to the Paris Agreement and the World Health Organization. But it's not only the United States that have work to do in strengthening ties. We all have to evaluate our role in the world. Democracy is under pressure everywhere. In his recent memoirs, President Obama writes that democracy is on the brink of a crisis. We should all share his sense of urgency. As the international city of peace and justice, democracy is rooted in The Hague's DNA. As host city of the first peace conferences in 1899 and 1907, we have always provided a platform to make progress in the field of international law possible. Today, The Hague is the proud home of more than 300 international organizations and NGOs with a proven track record in creating a better world. However, achieving justice requires more than just the establishment of institutions. It's necessary to network and connect at a local and international level. The Hague will continue to offer itself as a hub for discussions on democracy and the rule of law even in these virtual corona times. Ladies and gentlemen, whenever I speak about this subject, I feel Eleanor Roosevelt is looking over my shoulders. As she put it, without concerned citizen action to uphold rights close to home, we shall look in vain for progress in the larger world, in small places close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world. I am grateful to the Brookings Institute and the Klingendal Institute for cooperating with the Netherlands Embassy in Washington and the municipality of The Hague in organizing this important discussion. I wish you all an inspiring session. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, to our Dutch partners for organizing that. And thank you to Saskia Bruyneus and uh, the municipality of The Hague um, that um, uh, is funding this, uh, this cooperation. And uh, it's a useful reminder uh, just how, uh, how intense the involvement and, and how long the, the role of, of smaller European nations with a, with a robustly global outlook for centuries has been in the development of the global order, even in pre-modern times, but then again uh, in, in modern times with um, hosting not just the, the Hague Court of Justice, the, the, the chief court of the United Nations, but also the International Criminal Court and the and the special courts for war crimes in Yugoslavia and in, and in Rwanda. 
Um, in, in that way, the Netherlands have really had an outsized role in the development of global order and, and global legal norms. And it's, it's a, I think that's a useful reminder. So what we're going to talk about today is, again, transatlantic cooperation on global public goods. And I want to introduce our distinguished panel. Um, our two speakers uh, are Louise van Schaik, the head of EU and global affairs at the Klingendal Institute, and my colleague and center director, Thomas Wright, director of the Center on the US at the Brookings Institution and senior fellow. And the way we're gonna do this is we will have a 40 minutes moderated conversation between each, uh, between Tom and, and Louise, after which we will have a 20 minutes Q and A from our audience, which will be fielded by T. Stumps, who is also the co-author with Louise of a recent report um, for the European Parliament, which I have right here, No Way Back, Why the Transatlantic Future Needs a Stronger EU. And all of this is on the record, and um, we, I will start by asking both of you, if I may, and I'll start with you, Tom, um, to give us an elevator pitch, um, an elevator pitch on um, the value, Tom, of the US to Europe. If you read, I don't know whether you had a time to look at Louise and Tams's report. It, I think, is shot through with, I would say the trauma of the past four years of, of the Trump administration, and also some robust Dutch skepticism, also articulated in a very frank Dutch way, about just how much it will be possible to do together between America and Europe in, in, in these times. So what, what is the worth of transatlantic cooperation to skeptic Europeans? Elevator pitch, so three minutes max, I would say. That's a, that's a very long elevator ride, but I, I will do my best. Okay. Make it shorter. Uh, we're in a skyscraper. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, Louise and Tees, great to great to be on a, a, a panel with you both, and, and congratulations on the, on the paper, which I really liked. Um, to Constanza's question, I fully understand the sort of the skepticism. Um, I think particularly of the last four years, but also perhaps of the last twenty. I mean, we've been talking obviously about a transatlantic rift um, for some time. It's very acute during the George W. Bush administration. Even in the Obama administration, there was concerns not about really a disalignment of values and interests, um, but about the US shifting toward Asia, maybe being less focused um, on Europe. And I think the pandemic um, honestly really exacerbates all of this because it really reminds Europeans that they cannot rely on other powers um, to protect their interests. They have to focus um, on their own strength and whether we call that autonomy um, or something else, I think there's more than a kernel of truth to that. Um, my point though would be um, that as we look at the world and um, that there is uh, sort of an ideological divide, even if we don't call it that, between two different systems of governance, a democratic, a liberal democratic system of governance and a more authoritarian uh, system of governance. Now, the authoritarianism obviously represented by uh, China and by Russia, but also by nationalist populist voices within our own societies, right, as we're seeing here, sort of in the US um, at the moment. But I think if you look at Trump's own personal view on things, he tends to see the world a little bit more like some of the authoritarian strongmen than maybe Angela Merkel would or Emmanuel Macron uh, would. So um, these lines are blurred um, a little bit, but I think they do very much pertain to how we tackle sort of modern challenges, whether it's global public health and the need for transparency, whether it's technology and data questions, and um, whether or not it's resisting coercion attempts as Australia is facing at the moment um, from China and as European countries have also faced from a variety of countries. All of those things, I think, are things that democracies could only really handle together. Um, and so my sort of elevator pitch, Constanza, I guess, would be that what we need to do is to show that democracies working together and the US and Europe being at the core of that can actually fundamentally uh, uh, affect 
international relations and politics and international cooperation in a way that directly benefits people, right? This is not just about South China Sea or, you know, the, or, um, uh, or Crimea and Eastern Ukraine um, and all of these areas where you have geopolitical clashes. It's fundamentally about the type of life that people live and whether or not their anxieties about the global level can be addressed. And I think the only way we can address those uh, is essentially together and that there aren't uh, alternative better partners out there um, for the US and for Europe other than each other and Asian democracies as well, which I think are important piece of it. Thanks. All right, thank you very much, Tom. Um, and and I'm, I'm glad you sort of mentioned the Asian democracies uh, at the end. I would add perhaps also civil societies in countries that are authoritarian run um, we have seen in Poland and, and in Hungary, but also in, in the Indo-Pacific and South, in uh, Southeast Asia, um, civil societies that are very much, um, you know, trying to reach out and, and hoping for support from Western democracies. Um, by the way, I have um, a, a bunch of of workers up in the apartment up above me who are having who are doing renovations and having the radio blaring very loudly. I hope that doesn't come over <laughs> on this event. Good. I'm glad to see you shaking your heads. It's a bit strange here. Um, uh, I will move over to you, Louise, please, and ask you what would your elevator pitch be for convincing skeptical Europeans? And again, this is a skeptical skepticism that comes through loud and clear. And all of us Europeans, I'm a German, know how hard it has become to argue for transatlantic cooperation in the last four years. How do you convince, um, conversely, um, and this is now. I'm going to move to the other side. How do you convince Americans, skeptical Americans, of the value of Europe to their to their purposes? What's what's your pitch? Well, I, I agree very much with Tom that the essence is about uh, uh, that we need to demonstrate in the current world order that democracy works. That if you trust the people to bring their votes every four or five years. Uh, that this will allow them to choose their own leaders and their own political programs, their own policies. Democracy isn't perfect, but it's a completely different system than an autocratic system, a party, party in the lead system, a dictatorship. And uh, I think we have to showcase also in this pandemic uh, its worth and our belief in its, uh, in its, in its working. And that's if essentially the essence because we are the biggest democracies, eh? the European part and the US, of course, there's others, Canada, the, Japan, Australia, South Korea, and so on and so forth in Latin America, in Africa. But I think we are the biggest and the most powerful ones. Why should the US care about Europe? Uh, because Europe is by far its biggest trading partner and it's also the biggest trading bloc in the world. It's also the world. And we share a lot in terms of historical and cultural ties in addition to democracy. Uh, not in all European countries, but in most European countries, we still have a fully fledged uh, democracy. So I think this is very important to realize and we're also very supportive of doing things together internationally eh? because we have this, you know, multilateralism in, it, in our DNA. Sometimes maybe we're even a bit naive in this, um, but at least, you know, you can count on us uh, when it comes to promoting policies at the international level, combating global challenges. Uh, and also investing in the multilateral system financially. I think I'll leave it here. There's more right. to talk about later. Thank you very much. I, th I think one of the one of the issues that we might want to raise during discussion is also the degree to which Europe uh, is willing and able to provide leverage um, for common purposes, where um, where we're dealing with autocratic large rivals who are also important trading partners for us uh, or sources of energy, meaning China and Russia, 
um, and whether we are in fact able to provide um, the European cohesion that would be necessary to do all that. I mean, we're, we're in, the, in, a, in a crucial week for the future of Europe uh, where we are discussing Brexit, where we are discussing whether to um, exclude uh, European countries that uh, we feel do not live up to the rule of law uh, as codified in European treaties from the European Recovery Fund. Um, and that in turn has a consequence for, for the funding of the, of, the Europe, of, of the EU in coming years in the middle of a historic recession. Um, but we'll come to that. Let me perhaps, uh, I, I think it would, be, it would be helpful if we could address a couple of quite specific global uh, public goods that uh, we have to work on urgently. And obviously the first one here is global public health. Um, as we both on both sides of the Atlantic are seeing a massive spike in, in, in pandemics um, with huge, and I think at this point, unquantifiable uh, implications for our national orders and, 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 our, and our relationship. Tom, you've been working on a book with Colin Carl on, um, a global, on global public health. Do you want to start us off here? Where do, you think, where do you think we should most urgently act together and what are possible red lines and risks? Yeah, thanks, Constanza. Um, I, I think the most interesting thing and disturbing thing about the COVID-19 crisis you know, is that it occurred in an era of sort of nationalist populism where there was virtually no international cooperation. And, you know, the global public health expert, Laurie Garrett, uh, recently said, you know, in all of the exercises that she participated in planning for a pandemic, not a single one assumed that the president of the United States would be actively sabotaging the effort, <laughs> you know, although that's what's happened. And in China, of course, we had, I think, after a decade and a half um, of hope that there was reform uh, on their side and that they will be more transparent and that they went back to the more secretive and repressive practices of the SARS sort of era and response in 2003 and raised real questions about whether or not that cooperation with them had worked or, or, or been effective. And obviously we've seen shortcomings in the WHO and I think more worryingly even the, the global population, and particularly in Western countries, is, is divided. I mean, you have a significant number of people in the United States who don't believe the pandemic is all that serious and don't believe in wearing masks or doing simple mitigation measures. And the reason all of this, I think, is a big problem is because this is not the last pandemic, right? Given what is happening around the world and, and a variety of different developments, we can expect future pandemics of different severity. Um, one in the future could be worse, it could be more fatal um, than COVID-19 and as contagious. And so we really need to prepare um, now on that. So I think the incoming Biden administration, there's a long list of things they can do in the first few weeks, including joining COVAX and ACTA and recommitting to the WHO and having a G20 summit to try to, you know, address the global recovery piece of this. Um, but over the medium to long term, um, there are real questions, I think, of how do we uh, have a real uh, uh, accounting for what happened over the last sort of 10 years and learn all of the tough lessons because there are easy villains here, um, but there are also mistakes um, that a lot, uh, a lot of institutions made. For instance, you know, the WHO I was very skeptical of travel restrictions um, coming into this, whereas now that will be uh, seen as quite important. So I think we have a lot to do um, and we need to do it cooperatively and globally, um, but ultimately we maybe also need to work in more coalitions of the like-minded when not everyone comes along and we need to think about politics being an obstacle in the next crisis as well as in the past one. Um, Tom, let me follow up on that, if I may. Um, I think you and I were, were at the last Munich Security Conference together, uh, where one of the speakers, there was a keynote by the head of the WHO, um, if you'll recall, which the was... Side room, I think, not on the main stage. Yeah. Well, it was, it was, 
if I re recall correctly, remarkably, um, remarkably, shall we say, pro-Chinese. Um, and you know what I'm getting at. How do we how do we deal with the fact that the the that China for a variety of reasons, including I think uh, a dereliction of attention um, by by Western governments, not least the United States, but I would also say not only the United States, has very successfully, effectively inserted itself in key UN organizations. Um, and is managing now to shape the rules to its liking. Um, what, how do we deal with that, that, given that we also need Chinese cooperation on, on these key issues? Yeah, no, it's a great point. I just make a couple of points in response. Firstly, while I would be critical of the WHO, I think it's also important to remember that internally, there was a lot of concern inside the WHO about what China was doing. And yep. they felt that they needed to um, be publicly praising in order to get access. Now, Ted Ross, mm -hmm. I think, was at the far end of that. And he was maybe more inclined to take China's word for it. But it was a mixed picture inside the WHO. And the reason that's important, Constanza, is because the Trump administration could have chosen to work with its allies inside the WHO to put pressure on China and to build a global coalition within, or a coalition of the like-minded within the WHO structures. It didn't mm. do that, it chose to leave instead. So um, the WHO is complicated, um, but it's not a lost cause. I think it's worth um, sort of fighting for. I think you do put your finger on a very crucial point, which is, you know, it's hard for me to imagine Xi Jinping ever agreeing to the level of transparency required to allow the international community access in the early stages of a pandemic. So what we need to do, I think, is think more about how do we get the WHO to have the type of powers um, that we associate with the International Atomic Energy Association, right, for intrusive inspections and the like. Now that seems very far-fetched and I think it is far-fetched, but you could imagine if there's a future pandemic that if Europe and Japan and the United States and Australia and, and Vietnam maybe and many others who handle this pretty well, South Korea came together and said, if you don't allow access, then we will put in place these containment measures immediately because we can't allow this to spread until you prove otherwise. That could be the type of, that, that could provide the type of teeth required to actually um, generate a more transparent and cooperative response. So I think we need to be thinking about leverage and we need to be thinking about a lack of cooperation as well as sort of the universal aspect, which is also obviously very yeah. important in bringing China into the fold there too. Right, thank you very much, Tom. Um, well, over to you, Louise. It, let, and let's stay with the topic of global health for a moment. Um, I mean, you point out in your report that the pandemic has highlighted divisions in the Western world, but it's also highlighted them in Europe. One of the first things that happened in Europe at the beginning of the pandemic um, is that, I'm sorry, I'm grinning because the workers above me are clearly trying to scrape the floor right over my head. Uh, the, all of the European states are close their borders against against each other and and you as as sitting in the netherlands know how incredibly important cross-border labor movement is on a daily basis between the netherlands and belgium the netherlands and germany and france um this was disastrous for not just for european sort of citizens and and economies um on an immediate basis but also disastrous for a sense of european unity and cohesion how do we how, how do we deal with this issue in the future in Europe? Because as Tom says, we are sure to see more pandemics. Yeah, it was clear that there was a lot of coronationalism, as it was called, um, in the EU, and also that everybody was really a bit shocked by that. But I guess in the end of the day, because in so many countries we had lockdowns that we could hardly leave our house, then you know, crossing borders is also not that important well in a longer term perspective perhaps yes but and and fortunately also the the borders were reopened well 
relatively quickly again. But it was also that sometimes the measures were taken without, you know, informing your neighbors. Uh, uh, that was a bit. Uh, that was a bit shocking. I, I, if you allow me, I, I would like to say just a few words about the the WHO. Uh, because um, we had actually our minister Sigrid Kaag in another webinar at Klingendaal in April. It was one of her first webinars. And WTO we or the WHO? W on the on, on global health, on the World Health yeah, Organization. Right. And we asked her this exact question, you know, should the uh, World Health Organization also have weapon inspectors? Like she, you know, went into Syria herself for the UN to get out the chemical weapons. Um, uh, super sensitive. Could you envisage something like this? Uh, under the international health regulations of the World Health Organization and then, you know, avoid the situation as it unfolded at the beginning of 2020 in China. Um, but she was also very cautious, I think, in her answer. I mean, the, the webinar is available online. People can still watch it. She was also very cautious. Uh, and I also think that this is a huge dilemma because on the one hand you really want you know uh, the US and the EU they want now to reform the World Health Organization for the first time perhaps in its history or at least in the past 20 years they take the organization serious <laughs> because in all honesty they have really neglected it and under the Obama government you had the global health security agenda which was one of these alternatives uh, to the UN and which was also not liked for for by other countries in the world because they saw it as a West you know, initiative. And that's one of the big dilemmas that we have now with regard to the multilateral system. Are we going to, you know, support multilateral institutions in the UN, which have become more Chinese? Or are we going to go back to setting up alternative transnationalist mechanisms? And also for some fields, it might be more difficult to establish new, you know, typical UN style agencies if it comes to data or privacy related issues because we have so many more autocracies in this world. So I, th I think the whole World Health Organization case is super emblematic for, let's say, the wider states of UN agencies uh, in this world. And that has become really clear, but also the need for the transatlantic countries to cooperate uh, because indeed, uh, otherwise, uh, we will not have enough cloud to make that reform. I mean, the EU tried at the World Health Organ uh, Assembly with its resolution and with, you know, catalyzing the uh, ECTE and, 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 and COVAX facility. Uh, but we could really use the help of the US, I guess, in this matter. Mm -hmm. By the way, I just want to say, if you two want to sort of uh, butt in and ask each other questions, please feel free. I don't want to be the only one directing this, directing this conversation. This should be as informal as possible. But I do want to ask you, Louise, given, given what you and Tom have both said about the difficulties of managing, um, of finding workable sort of policy coalitions at a UN level when um, non-Western, non-democratic powers have been quite successful in shaping policy and, uh, and setting up constraints for Western democracies. Doesn't that mean, Louise, that um, we ought to um, create structures on the European side that prevent um, them from splitting each other when it matters. The Chinese have become very successful at inserting themselves in European policy debates um, when they are worried that we might cohere too much. So, and, and I notice that this is something you don't really discuss in your report. Is this, is, is global health uh, and health policy an area where there ought to be more, more European integration? It's not traditionally been, field, been a field of European integration because it's considered domestic policy. Do you yeah, have a position on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think there should, well, there are efforts now for the health union and also there were council conclusions on global health. Again, the last ones were, mm -hmm. were from 2010 and uh, they were quickly forgotten as we pointed out in some of the publications. Uh, but it's absolutely a field where uh, the EU should step up its game um, and, and take more outspoken uh, positions. What we have seen in the pandemic indeed is all these ridiculously nationalized responses, each country with their own health institutes, their own national distancing policies. Uh, well, what you've probably also seen in the US between the federal and the state level that there were these divergences of how to approach this. 
and I think we could benefit a lot from um, from from Europeanization also in this field, also with regard to patient rights and and other issues. Uh, steps have been made, um, um, but I guess more is possible in this in this regard. Is where do you see where do you see Dutch politics on this? You you also have a you know fairly effective populist movement as have had as of we all, which presumably would would resist this. Do you think that your current government would be would be able to support such a such a move? Yeah, in all honesty, I, I think the Netherlands is relatively absent in the discussions on European health and international health uh, policy. We're not very outspoken. Uh, we struggle a lot with our own COVID response domestically, and um, yeah, I, I've been a bit, um, yeah, I've I've been a bit ashamed actually of my own country's absence in this in this field. So to be honest with you. Well, um, I didn't want to put you sort of on the on the on the spot here. Um, you know, f f I I would have I, similar issues on, on on Germany, and I'm sure you know if there were more Europeans on this call, we would all uh, we would all pitch in with criticisms of what's happening in our own field, but uh, and in our own national d domains. Um, let me ask you, since we have about ten minutes more to before we go to Q and A. What do you think, besides the urgent matter of climate change, um, are the sort of low-hanging fruit on, um, on, on global public goods that Europe and America could work on together before uh, domestic constraints of one form or another kick in? Tom, let me start with you. Thanks. I would just um, say, just to follow on, just one thing Louise said, you know, I think to me, the European Union has actually dealt with the pandemic pretty well. Um, you know, it's interesting that on this occasion with the second wave, borders weren't closed, um, whereas they were the first time around. And there wasn't the same type of scramble for critical medical supplies, um, with countries stealing each other's supplies and generally you know, having a beggar the neighbor approach that didn't occur. Picking up and, stuff at airports, yes. And March and April was a pretty traumatic time for everyone, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we can sort of chalk that up to just human nature and what happened all over the world. Um, but I think the way the EU has sort of evolved since um, has been positive and, and they've learned sort of important lessons. And, you know, the federal structure is something that occurs all over the world also. I mean, in Australia, which has handled it pretty well, they have problems too with the different, with the different you know, constituent parts of the country not being able to get a single policy that they've had to deal with here in the US. Of course, we've had something in Germany. You know, of course, there's a federal system. So there's all sorts of, you know, what's happened at the European level, I think is not very atypical. So I'm somewhat encouraged, I would just say, but on your question, Constanza, I mean, none of this, I think is low hanging fruit because it's mm -hmm. all very hard, particularly on climate. Um, but the one I would sort of draw attention to is, is I think with the, with the global, I don't know if this technically qualifies as a global public good, but on globalization and the global economy, you know, we now know over the last 10 years, that people have real anxieties about many aspects of the global economy. Some of this is feeding populism inside our own countries. Um, you know, there's all sorts of different effects of it. We have generally, as a transatlantic community, focused our foreign economic policy on increasing openness and tariff reduction, regulatory alignment. I think the time has come to really to try to tackle some of those key anxieties um, that people have. So whether or not it's the international tax regime and the way in which some companies, you know, don't pay tax anywhere at any point, um, whether it's climate economics, you know, whether or not it's data issues or how to have an industrial policy to ensure that our societies are competitive with Chinese technological companies like ZT and Huawei. Um, there's a, a number of things that can be done as a community uh, and also more broadly uh, with other democracies uh, to ensure that that international economic order is actually seen as a benefit for citizens in their everyday lives and not something that's sort of abstract 
or funneled through the interests of corporations? Well, interestingly, we've we, we've learned that the the current president of of the United States uh, is is in agreement with uh, with you on um, on at I least one it. very <laughs> <laughs> at least one. I mean, it's it's a rare instance, but at least one one major social media company. But but what do you, Tom? Let me let me push this back at you. What do you think is realistic here? I mean, this these these aren't new issues. Um, and the pandemic and the and its economic consequences, which I think we are far from being able to quantify yet at this point, is going to increase pressures for protectionism and, and nationalism. How do you how do you square that circle practically? And how do you particularly if you I mean we're now seeing an, an incumbent president who is making it clear that there is going to be opposition against the, the incoming Biden administration, not just from day one, as we thought, but before day one. Um, and, and we also, I think, have a distinct risk of the Senate staying in Republican hands and maybe in the 2022 midterms, the Congress uh, becoming Republican as well, given how narrow the margins uh, of some of the, the Democrats um, uh, were. How realistic is it that we, in what may just be a window of opportunity that's 18, 18, 20 months long, that we can find a, a measure of any of the ones that you've, that, that you've named, digital taxation, climate economics, data issues, industrial policy, where we convince, where we can build a, a, a transatlantic approach that is resilient against populist pressures? Yeah, um, well, there's a lot there, Constanza. I, I just, I guess on the first, I'll get to the Senate piece in a second, but I would just encourage everyone not to um, adopt sort of a dichotomous choice between openness on the one hand and protectionism on the other, you know, and that anything that is not an old style FTA is protectionist or a resilient agenda in response to the pandemic is protectionist. Um, I think what we need are a series of sort of outcome focused cooperative efforts, a little bit like maybe the proliferation security initiative back after 9-11, right? Where you have sort of an outcome focused coalition that tackles real problems, let's say on technology and other issues that begins to generate sort of results. And we shouldn't tie ourselves up too much with over institutionalizing this or trying to make it part of a major multilateral. Um, let's accumulate a lot of different wins on these mm -hmm. areas and then see where we are. So that would be just my advice on that. I think your point on the Republicans is very well taken and I think it's a huge issue. I think there is one, um, one simple answer which may not be the right answer, but I think it probably is, which is that the only way to get a Trumpian Republican party on board for internationalism is to make a significant piece of it about responding to China, right? That's literally the only way that you're gonna get a bipartisan consensus. It's the only way you're gonna get bipartisan engagement in international institutions to compete for sort of liberal values. It's the only way you're gonna get support really for, I think for NATO in the future from, from Trumpian Republicans. Um, and the question that we have is, you know, as, as a, just a community, is that something that we think is A, justified on the merits and B, something that we can manage in a way that it doesn't sort of spiral into something we don't want? Yeah. Um, and if not, um, then what is the cost of having only one party basically supporting an internationalist agenda? Exactly. And my view is that it's doable. It's, I think it yeah. is doable. Right, right. Uh, let me move right over to you, Louise, because um, that, that is a problem that structurally exists in, in Europe as well, not just because of the divisions between, uh, between European countries, but within them. What do you think um, is, is the outlook for a constructive, uh, a, a constructive cooperation on, 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 on it, within the next 18, 20 months? Would you, can you tell us one or two examples uh, that, and you, that you've also listed in your report where you think it might be possible to come to an agreement quickly 
that doesn't then get immediately torpedoed within Europe from a, a shutdown from our side? What do you think? Yeah, I think there's also a few topics that we haven't explicitly listed in our uh, report that might be, you know, areas where we could step up cooperation, uh, uh, which could, for instance, include space governance or uh, geoengineering. So should we, you know, fiddle in the atmosphere to save the climate? <laughs> uh, but then if we do that, do we allow everybody to do that or, or you know? So there is a number of issues that have been identified over the past years on global public goods that could be addressed and that are perhaps less, you know, extremely politicized. I mean, uh, I mean, in Europe, in Brussels, they say TTIP, you know, is in the deep freezer. <laughs> so nobody really dares to make another free trade agreement with the US because it was so sensitive with all the, you know, standards for food safety, GMOs, uh, there were such divides. So even with, you know, Democrats, it's going to be difficult. So in our report, we talk about these examples of these mini deals in the field of trade, maybe different types of trade agreements, less focused on tariffs or less this focused on safety, uh, environmental and food safety standards. Um, I guess there is a tendency both in the US now with the case uh, um, uh, to, I don't, I don't know how to say it in English, to, uh, to, uh, to ask from Amazon to, to get rid of Instagram and, and WhatsApp. Uh, and bundle, yeah, bundle. Break, break up the Amazon empire, yeah. Yeah, and, but also the tendency with the elections, you know, that you had all these warnings on Twitter, like this is false yeah, information uh, and Facebook. And I, I guess there is a there is a um, uh, there is a big appetite in both the U.S. society, but also in the European society to uh, to codify some of that, uh, to to turn that into meaningful legislation that showcases that. Uh, we're not censor censoring or we're not cutting free press uh, uh, but, and we're not cutting privacy, but we're, you know, balancing off these things. So, so I, I guess there's a lot of issues where we can make uh, meaningful new international agreements, uh, deals um, uh, that will really be also good for, let's say, selling uh, the politicians to the domestic audiences. <laughs> uh, really what I'm hearing you say, Louise, is, is that um, the, there are really what we should need to do is um, not sort of big eye catching sort of catch all agreements, but lots of small pragmatic fixes to specific problems, um, which I mean, sounds reasonable to me. I am conscious of the passage of time. Um, and Thies, you've been the one, you, you're the one collecting questions. You're also the co-author of, of this report on uh, from, from Klingendahl. So maybe you want to throw a couple of questions at us and tell us whom they are directed at. Yeah, perfect. Um, and actually, I think lots of the questions that have, had been sent in beforehand and indeed were asked during the session were also answered during the session. So I think we're uh, really making headway. Um, uh, one that was touched upon, but I think we can have some more comments on, um, was asked during the uh, seminar. Um, and uh, it's the question, basically, and I'm paraphrasing and simplifying a bit, what parts of the Trumpian critique of the EU itself, of the EU institutions um, and EU policy ought we take seriously? And should the EU take on as maybe ambitions to improve uh, in the years to come, even though the Trump administration is coming to an end. Um, and actually, I would be interested to hear both your opinions on that. That's, a, that's actually an excellent question. Who wants to go first? I, I can jump in. I mean, look, I, I actually think this is one area where the, nothing that they said about the EU was accurate or helpful. I mean, I, I think it, it's important to sort of understand that they had virtually nobody I mean, a couple of people I could mention, um, you know, Fiona, our colleague, Wes Mitchell, uh, although he had particular views in the EU, but he did understand the EU, I think, to some extent. But by and large, the Trump administration didn't understand the EU at all. And the president particularly didn't understand it. And so he saw it primarily as an economic rival like China. I don't think he wanted it. I think he wanted it to break up. 
right? That's what he said at the beginning. I think that was his view throughout. He was heavily influenced by Nigel Farage. That was not obviously everyone in the administration, but for the most part, it was just a complete blind spot. So when they wanted to work on China together, after initially not turning to Europe at all, they turned to NATO at that point. And it was only at the very end that Pompeo sort of realized he needed to do this through the EU as well. And then they started something that never really got started, which is this dialogue that will continue next year. So um, I, I don't think there's a huge amount to be learned um, there. I think the overall lesson really is on the China account, which is that uh, if the US wants to work with Europe, on China, it has to do so with the EU. It can't just be with NATO and it can't just be bilaterally. And that there is a strategic interest that the US has in the EU being a strong and, and effective actor on the world stage. That does not preclude a strong relationship with the UK as well, while helping the UK and the US-UK relationship now that they've left. Um, but I think a strong EU is very much in America's interest. And that, in a way, I guess, is the opposite uh, sort of approach um, that President Trump had anyway, even if you had a couple of people, I think, who, 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 who had a more nuanced view. Louise, do you agree? Yeah, I do agree. I, I want to bring in an additional uh, element, um, which is, I think that the EU indeed has a tendency not to be very self-critical, at least not the Brussels institutions, because, you know, there is not really a European demos um, holding them to account. And incidentally, we have these, you know, affairs like the Selmayr affair, uh, the Selmayr uh, gate affair. Uh, um, but I, but I guess, you know, the, the member of the European Parliament of the Orban party that was uh, caught in, a, in an illegal homo party uh, last weekend received more attention than the, the, the Selmayr gate affair a few years ago, where it was far more severe and, and, and problematic. Uh, what I, I think is a trend uh, in, in the past years is that because probably also of uh, the US neglect of the EU, but also because of other reasons, that you saw a huge rise of, of Germany and France as kind of spokespersons on behalf of the EU. And I'm personally really, really worried about that. Not because I don't like Merkel and Macron. I think they're great European leaders uh, and I have a, a lot of respect for them. Um, uh, but I think it's worrisome that let's say two countries uh, uh, with of course a big population and um, uh, tend let's say to overtake the EU and the rest of the European countries seem to passively accept that. And also it leads to an hollowing out of the EU institutions as such as spokespersons for the EU. So for instance, today I, you know, I went to the political website to see how they cover the, the European Council meeting of today and tomorrow. And then you see this photo of Merkel, Macron, von der Leyen, um, um, and, and, and it just, you know, it's just for me, it's too much. I mean, the EU is more than France and Germany. And I also hope that, uh, let's say, the other European countries become more concerned. About Louise, the frugal four were pretty important in the European recovery negotiations. Um, yeah, for blocking things, but not for initiating new ideas and bringing in okay. new impetus. Fair enough. Yeah. 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 yeah, and, yeah. and, and size I, and size shouldn't yeah. be shouldn't be a hindrance for for ideas. I mean, I actually I tend to agree with you on both counts, if I if I may. I mean, I am I'm always concerned when the when the big two or big three in Europe um, sort of drown out the other ones. Um, that's not helpful. But um, but yeah, it's I mean this the 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 pandemic um, and its and its impact is is. Of course, limiting the bandwidth and the and the energy that 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 all countries have for for new initiatives. So um, my hope, yeah. if you allow Sorry, me, you. would also be for the new Biden administration to look at the EU institutions and to engage them as their primary interlocutors and to understand how the EU works internally, and also to consider perhaps you know a few offers, you know, maybe joining the EU connectivity answer as a joint answer to BRI, looking at the G5, uh, G, uh, uh, at Ericsson and Nokia's European champions that could maybe help uh, 
uh, the shift um, to G5 in the US, um, things like this. So just to, you know, to help also a bit this European understanding that it's Brussels that is in the lead and maybe not, especially also because there will be elections in Germany and France, so they will probably push more their own agendas even more um, yes. in the coming period. So I, I guess that's also something that, 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 that I would hope for secretly. Uh, yeah. the, I, the, the elections are a very good point. You will see both Germany and France being more inward looking and there will be both space and a real need for other European co uh, countries to step up with, with initiatives. But I'm seeing the questions pile up. Thies, go for it. So actually, there were quite a lot of questions on this last point that uh, Louise has just hinted at, namely that um, since Obama's pivot to Asia and um, the more recent uh, EU connectivity strategy, uh, both transatlantic partners have clearly um, explicated a priority of engaging with Asia. Now, I think, um, and this is one of the reasons many questions came in on this, um, that's too big of a statement. So Asia has many, many things and many, many areas. Um, should we, um, will there be closer cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, specifically in Central Asia and the Middle East? So maybe... Um, uh, to Thomas and Louisa in this huge field of pivoting to Asia together, uh, if not apart, um, what should be the specific priorities? Um, uh, uh, and Louisa already said maybe the EU should invite the US to join its connectivity strategy. That's an interesting uh, train of thought. Um, but could we make that more specific so that in, the, in those first 18 months, um, uh, something can be put on the agenda? Um, Louisa Thomas, maybe this is again. About stuff. Let's, let's start with, with, with Louise. Yeah, I think for the. It's also clear in the in the article that uh, Josep Borrell, the uh, high representative of the EU, just published in Foreign Policy, uh, that he's really eyeing to the Indo uh, now the Asia Pacific as it's uh, as it's called, but also to indeed uh, to cooperate more uh, with Japan, South South uh, Korea, and Australia. Um, and also, I guess that the EU wants to step up its presence in the region. Uh, so I'm super curious to see if that would also include it in the in in the in the debate on European defence, common security and defence policy. Whether the EU is actually also going to consider that to go beyond, you know, peacekeeping missions in the in the neighbourhood countries, maybe also eventually include even the Arctic, <laughs> um, uh, uh, but also the Indo-Pacific region. And we know, of course, that the US has this huge military base and is so concerned about the South China Sea issue. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that the EU also becomes a bit more strategic about that uh, in that respect. I leave it here. Tom? Yeah, I mean, I guess I have a little bit of a different view in that, I mean, the US has huge strategic interests in the Indo-Pacific and obviously a major president's key relationships. I, I think I don't see really how much, I'm not convinced that Europe's efforts are best placed in trying to play in that space, right? And to engage in fun ops in the South China Sea and to you know, build military ties. I mean, that all sounds fine and welcome, but I think it's a bit of a distraction from the key point, which is, you know, competition with China is going to be in all of these domains that are not necessarily kinetic, right? There's a kinetic, there's a military dimension to it. The US is doing that with its allies in, in Asia, but on all of these issues, whether it's the economic side or especially on technology and 5G and AI and counter coercion, I would be much happier if Europe, uh, you know, focused on sort of those tech questions, on the counter coercion questions, on the working with the US uh, to put pressure on China and global economic reform, uh, building those coalitions of the like minded. Um, inoculating sort of the EU from the negative externalities of sort of the authoritarian system, whether it's in China or Russia or mm -hmm. elsewhere. All of those, I think, are where Europe has real capability and a real possibility to affect the outcome. Um, so I think that that is, and also I think it is easier to make that case to the European public that they have a vested interest in action in those areas. Whereas 
you know, being more of a geopolitical player in the Pacific, I think, especially in a post-COVID era, just sounds very divorced from what a person would think their actual sort of interests and livelihood is, is about, right? So uh, again, I like, you know, I, I would support um, any sort of more active role uh, in Asia, but I think the main sort of focus is on those areas. And to do that, I think Constanza and Louise, I think one thing, yes, by all means, build closer ties to Asian democracies. I think that's crucially important. And a lot has been done there. I mean, 10 years ago, I think a lot of Europeans thought about Asia policy as China policy. Now there's a lot more contact, you know, with Japan, um, South Korea, Australia, and others. So long may that continue. Um, but I think let's focus on those areas where we really can make progress um, and ensure that democracies are in a more competitive uh, position globally. You know, I sometimes wonder whether these um, sort of attempts by Europeans, including by the Germans, uh, to to say that we have that they ought to have a security presence in the Indo-Pacific as well, is to signal to their own publics more than to say the Chinese that that that, that the security issues in the Indo-Pacific Pacific affect their trade presence and relationships as well. Honestly, I mean, that's I think that's the the sane way to read these to read these things, and that's not completely wrong. I think one shouldn't overestimate them. Do we have time for another another uh, question or two that we can then also turn into a final statement? I Please. think uh, yeah, I, I think so. Maybe if you don't have one, to choose one one last question out of the many many sent in, and why not bring it back to uh, uh, to the very start and the introduction by the dep deputy mayor because there were quite a lot of questions coming in on uh, the role of closer cooperation between the US and Europe on the level of cities and local government, especially mm -hmm. on strengthening a democracy and strengthening rule of law and addressing climate change, mm -hmm. uh, which I found very, a very interesting train, train of thought that I, I mean, we have two more minutes left, but I would love our speakers to, to venture into. Okay, great. Tom, I'm going to hand to you and then give Louise the Sorry, final. Uh, specifically on the role of cities in climate change or just cities in general or on, on, on these issues? The, the questions came in on yes. many, many different issues. Uh, so uh, um, uh, maybe the question would be um, in transatlantic cooperation on the level of cities, what ought to be prioritized and where do major sort of promising areas for cooperation lie? Yeah, I, I mean, I could start off. I think... Um, I think one way to think about this is that there is a country to country sort of competition piece to all of this and providing public goods, but there's also a society to society piece as well. And so much of what we're seeing in the modern world engages people at all different levels within society, right? So competition with China plays out geopolitically. It also plays out when, um, Beijing threatens to cut off all access for a European football club, right, from being able to show their uh, games in China and to put pressure on the league or on companies or individuals or cities in terms of exchange programs. Um, so I think we need a, a societal sort of conversation about what people think their values and interests are that need to be protected in this modern world and that then there's a greater understanding and show of solidarity at all of those different levels. So I think that would be my sort of major point. And I think beyond that, there's all sorts of things that can be done. I think clearly cities have a crucial role to play in climate change. And you know that's even more true here in the United States where federal legislation is going to be incredibly difficult to pass. And if it's passed, it may get reversed. Treaties are basically out of the question um, so the only real hope of progress we have is at the state and city level, and that's where it can be locked in and is yeah. more protected against future Absolutely. political shocks, right? So I think there, without a question, uh, that's crucially important also. Exactly. Louise, over to you. Yeah, well, I think it's clear that, let's say, in four years, Trump and before that Bush, we've always said, oh, yeah, we should continue our talks with the state level because a lot of energy policy, climate change policies are promoted there. We should cooperate with the companies that are willing, the U.S. foundations that work on, on climate and energy and the cities. 
Uh, so yes, definitely, we should continue to do so. In the Netherlands, we have a climate agreement uh, that was also established bottom up. But in all honesty, if I sometimes look at the real powers, for instance, that eldermen have um, to, and also the, the resources that they have to catalyze the energy transition, it's not that big. So in my own country, most of it still has to come from the federal level, I guess, although there's now also regional energy plans. Uh, but I think for the simple reason that indeed in the Senate, uh, there might not be a democratic majority and that things may change in the future. I think it's important to keep the networks and to and to continue this this effort to engage also with the society, societal and local government level uh, in the US. And that requires also the EU side to be better organized, I guess. I, I guess you guys are more organized in that respect. Uh, at the pen, let's say US federal level than, than we are currently. So that, that uh, would be good to, to establish that. So now I'm having the word, I would also like to just quickly make the use of this opportunity to thank you, Constanze, for the good cooperation and also the municipality of The Hague people. It was a great pleasure to organize this. And um, I hope that we can uh, continue working together also in the future. So just to end off, yeah, thanks. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, thank you for letting me moderate. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I thought this was a terrific discussion. And apologies to the audience that we couldn't deal with all of your questions. We hope to continue writing about and speaking about these issues. So, so stay in touch with our websites, with what we do and write. Um, I want to thank in particular Louise and Tom for, for engaging in conversation about this topic. For Thies, um, the co-author of, of the Klingendahl report for fielding the questions, and also for the people who aren't visible on this screen, but without whom organizing this wouldn't have been possible, our colleagues um, and our research staffers and our communications people who uh, made this all run, run very smoothly. It wouldn't work without them. And finally, again, also to our partners, the municipality of The Hague, and the Dutch Foreign Ministry, which funds the Briar Lecture in the spring, and hopefully which we can, will be able to do at some point when this damn pandemic is over. And um, with that, I'm going to say thank you to everyone. And um, I look forward to the work we continue to do together in one way or another. Thank you so much and stay safe and, and healthy, everybody. Bye-bye.